so we're going to open up the, the next session with um, major doctor Chris Orlowski. Um, and Chris is going to come up and talk to you about uh, the BTO approach to optimizing human performance. So Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? All right, so come back from break. I have a suit. You're going to have to wait for a few minutes for me to explain actually what I'm wearing. Um, I've been pressured and pushed to say a little bit about my background. So I am an Army officer. I'm also an Army doctor. I'm not the type of Army doctor you want cutting on you. Um, I am a doctor of philosophy, as it says right there. I studied aerospace engineering, um, which is a little bit of a difference from uh, being in the biological technologies office. What I studied in aerospace engineering was flapping wing micro air vehicles. So I guess that's a little bit of a relevance, but I did a lot of flight dynamics calculations, so not quite the same relevance. Uh, but my background is, is I was a, a commissioned as an armor officer. I spent a year in Iraq as a tank platoon leader, which means I, le I, I led 16 soldiers. We drove around in tanks. We drove around in Humvees. And at that time, I made a lot of life or death decisions on given days about sometimes those decisions were when to shoot and when not to shoot. Um, thankfully, most of those decisions ended up in being when not to shoot. Um, but why I say that is, is because soldiers, especially our deployed soldiers, and not just soldiers, but there are other humans that make tough decisions every day, you do it under physical stress, you do it under cognitive stress. And we're looking at ways to reduce that stress so you can make those make better informed, more informed decisions so you make the right decision more a portion of the time. But before we get into that, I want to talk about something I like. We'll talk about video games for a minute here. So yes, on the upper left, what you see is an Atari 2600 controller. Yes, I am old enough to have played Atari 2600. Uh, but the Atari 2600 was a pretty simple human interface, right? It was one button and you could move in eight directions. If you move the stick off and you weren't one of those eight directions, you weren't moving anywhere. Uh, my mom likes to tell me that I used to get mad at my dad when I was about three or four years old when he would beat me in an air-sea battle, but we've gone beyond that now, and now my kids get mad at me when I beat them in PlayStation 4, which is the controller up there on the right. And the PlayStation 4 is a significantly enhanced human-machine interface, right? You've got 11 or 12 buttons. This, you actually can move the controller in six degrees of freedom, and that will actually input to the screen, depending on the game. And why I say this, and why I'm talking to you about video games and adapting humans to tasks, is because part of the time in the Army, I spent doing this. And if you're not familiar with what this is, an iRobot Packbot is about a 60-pound robot. It was developed out of a DARPA program called the Tactical Mobile Robotics Program. And what those robots were used for, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, were the disposal of improvised explosive devices. And why I say it's a complex cognitive task, think about driving a vehicle that you can't see because you're driving it off of cameras. You're driving it up to a spot where there's an explosive that could hurt you or your friends or innocent civilians around you. And you now have to render that device safe. And you have to do that with different devices. You have to drive it. You have to use the cameras. You have to manipulate an arm to move up and pull that device out. And the first controllers looked like this one up here on the screen. You had a keyboard, you had paddles, if, to use the Atari 2600 story again, if you remember the old paddles where you would drove, they were really similar to that. But this is a great thing if you're in an air-conditioned room or if you're in a building. Well, fortunately, not every time you need to explode a bomb to be, make it safe is in a building. Sometimes you're walking. And so what we took was, the vid from video games, we adapted what we already... We use what humans have already been adapted to, and that is an honest-to-God Xbox 360 controller. When I spent time in Afghanistan running the robotics repair detachment there, we had Xbox 360 controllers on our shelves to replace it when it was broken. And this soldier is doing an EOD explosive ordnance disposal task dismounted. Complex, right? Now I want to add one more thing to it. You're being shot at. It's hot. You miss your family. You don't want to be there, some of, you, some of them and you're carrying a ton of weight, okay? The, the, the graph on the left, so shoulder, soldier load on the vertical axis over, over time. The recommended load has always been about 25 kilograms. Our soldiers today are carrying upwards of 100 to 120 pounds for 72 hours or more on missions. And so what we're trying to do at DARPA is figure out how we can optimize that performance, right? How do I reduce the load? How do I take off some of this weight either through transferring it to the ground or injecting energy into those young soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors so that they can perform their military missions in a better manner and make better decisions. 
So on the left, one of the things that DARPA invested in in the mid-2000s was exoskeletons. So if you're not familiar with what exoskeletons do, is they transfer load to the ground. So as you're standing still, you can carry a lot of weight, and it puts it all down to the ground, and you don't feel the load. But there's a catch. As soon as I start walking, I feel all that load, and now I have extra mass that I wasn't carrying before. And it turns out the problem here, if you look down here at the bottom, there's a lot of mass at your foot. And it actually turns out that putting mass at your foot is the worst place to put it from an energy expenditure standpoint. It's a thing called distal mass. The further away you get from the center of mass of the body, the worse it is for you. So DARPA did their investment here, waited a couple years, and a new idea came along, which is what I'm wearing now. And now I'm program manager for the Warrior Web program. I'm wearing a prototype Warrior Web suit that is designed, uh, designed and engineered by the Harvard VS team uh, with New Balance as a partner. It's kind of hard to see the feet from here, but on the bottom of my boots, I have carbon fiber reinforcement because we found that the amount of forces we're interjecting to get to a goal of a 25% meta, metabolic reduction were so high, they're actually causing blisters in the back of the feet. Um, I have gyros on my foot and my shank to send, uh, sense velocities and use that in the control system. I have webbing and I have actuation, um, and then the actuator housings are actually on the backpack here. I'm actually not carrying that much load right now. There's a big plastic container to keep the shape. So I was, as I said, I was a tanker. We didn't dismount. In fact, actually, the unofficial tank, tanker model was death before dismount. But um, <laughs> so I didn't do a lot of walking. I did a lot of riding. But at DARPA, and I work, I spend a lot of time in the tactical technology office as well, is I spend time focusing on the dismounted warfighter and how we can make those young men and ladies better at their job and have, allow them to uh, perform their jobs better. So if you hear as I walk around a little bit, you see the suit kicking in. And then if I, if I got a little bit of space, if I walk faster, you hear it go faster. And if I slow down, then it just assists a little bit. So there's a little bit of speed control here. We found that as you walk faster, you want to have more assistance. And we've also found that there's a lot of differences between humans. I walk like a duck. I tend to carry a little bit more muscle mass, as most soldiers do, than the typical graduate student, if you look at the populations <laughs> between those two. And so, what is, so why do we tie all this together? Um, the slide's titled Optimizing Human Performance, which is the, talk, the title of my talk. And the quote here is from Napoleon. He said this a couple hundred years ago. And it says that the moral is the physical is three to one. And what he was really trying to get at is saying is that the soldier's state of mind, and it's not exclusive to soldiers by any means, is much more important than their physical state of mind. Your mind can will you to do things that your body would say, no, I don't want to do that, and I can do it. And if anybody, we actually were having this talk at break, you talk a lot at work, or you're in front of a computer all day, and you get back, and you're just mentally tired, and you're fatigued, that cognitive performance and how to and that impact on you is very important. But unfortunately, it's probably not as simple, especially for complex tasks that soldiers perform, as a yerkes dodson law, which is just simply showing on the vertical axis your performance to the horizontal axis your stress. And ideally, you want to be kind of in the middle. You know, I don't want to be stressed too much. I don't want to be stressed too little. And then I can perform better. But it's probably not that simple. But with the explosion of physical fitness devices and tracking devices, I started running with Nike Plus about 10 years ago, and it's amazing how uh, this has exploded and how many devices are out there now. There's a ton of data out there addressing specifically that human variability. One of the things we found from the Warrior Web program is that if the controls are off a little bit, and if the controls are off a little bit from person to person, it can actually be destructive, and it can actually re in, um, increase your metabolic expenditures as opposed to decreasing it. So what I'm asking from you is if you have ideas that tie together cognitive and physical performance under the guise of human variability and how we do that in a broader scope to not only impact soldier performance, but first responder performance, especially with what's in the news lately about maybe ill-informed decisions. If we can impact everybody, everybody performs better, everybody has a better life. Um, so that's what, if you have interest in ideas, I'd love to talk to you. Unfortunately, I need to get off the stage because I'm about out of time, and I got to get these young engineers back to Harvard so they can keep working hard for DARPA. So thank you. Yeah.